All right, hello everybody and welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. My name is Katie, I use she, her pronouns, and I will be taking you on our tour of the universe today. Uh, I am behind you, in the booth behind you, uh, but you don't have to turn around to look at me because the show is going to be out in front of you. So we have a real great show for you today. Have any of you ever been to one of our planetarium shows here before? All right, I see a few hands. So this one is going to be a little bit different uh, than the ones we usually show because normally we have a pre-recorded video uh, and then the presenter, me, would give a short five minute little talk and then the show would continue. This one though is all live, so it's all me, baby. Uh, so I hope you enjoy my voice. Um, another uh, exciting thing about this show is we use a program called Open Space, which is uh, it's com kept completely up to date with all of the most recent data. So everything you're going to see is based on actual data, no artists' renditions or anything like that. And the data is as recent as yesterday. So when we look at Earth, for example, we're going to be seeing the weather patterns as they were 24 hours ago. Another cool thing about this program is that it is totally open source. So if you have a lot of room on your computer and a lot of patience, you can go home and download it for yourself. If you have questions about that, you can talk to me after the show. All right, uh, so before we get started on our tour of the universe, I have a few announcements, some housekeeping. First, please turn off or silence all the electronic devices, especially those cell phones. Keep them tucked away for the duration of the show. It's going to get pretty dark in here, and any excess light is going to be a distraction to those around you, and it's going to ruin all the hard work your eyes have done adjusting to the darkness. There's also no filming or photography during the show. There's no eating or drinking in the planetarium. Uh, this does include water bottles, and please be sure to keep your mask up over both your nose and mouth at all times. Thank you so much for doing your part to help keep everybody safe and healthy. Uh, speaking of safety, we also ask that you remain seated for the duration of the show. Again, it's going to get pretty dark in here, and these stairs can be difficult to climb. We also don't want you blocking one of our projectors and creating a U-shaped hole in the universe. If you do need to exit for some reason, please exit to the top of the stairs. Go up the stairs, not down. If at any time you feel any motion sickness, such as nausea or dizziness, we recommend that you sit back, close your eyes, remind yourself that you are sitting in a stationary theater and not flying through space, and the feeling should pass. All right, last call for cell phones. Please make sure they are silent and put away, and then we can get started. All right, so. We are going to start our tour right here at our home planet, planet Earth, which we're looking at partial daylight, partial nighttime. This is where almost all of human history has occurred and where all human beings live. Well, almost all human beings. At any given time, six astronauts or cosmonauts from countries all around the world are aboard the International Space Station living and working together. The International Space Station is about the size of a football field or three blue whales. So if you saw our blue whale out by the, uh, the rainforest, that gives you a sense of the size. As we zoom in here, we're gonna be able to see, see the kind of shape it is. Now this space station orbits at only 225 miles above the Earth circling our planet once every 90 minutes. That means that it's traveling at over 17,000 miles per hour. And here's the part where I make a bad joke. I wouldn't want to have to pay that speeding ticket. Thank you. So this is the furthest that humans currently travel into space, but it's not the furthest that we've ever been. Between 1969 and 1972, human beings went to the moon. So let's zoom out and get a sense of where the moon is from here. 
Now you're probably pretty familiar with the moon as you can see it usually at night. A lot of times you can see it during the daytime as well. So let's go take a little trip. So like I said, humans have walked on the moon. 12 NASA astronauts uh, got to go between 1969 and 1972. And the moon is a pretty cool place. So as we zoom in, uh, we're going to see the near side of the moon. And let me turn off the night so that we can really see it. Moon night off, there we go. And you can notice that this side of the moon has some bright patches and also has those dark patches called mare, or one is called a maria, because the uh, astronomers used to think that they were oceans. Mare means sea in Latin. But now we know that they are actually volcanic plains, so the result of ancient volcanic eruptions on the moon. And you can see in those areas, there's very few craters, indicating that it's a much younger surface because those volcanoes, their eruptions filled in those craters, changing the surface. But as we go around to the far side of the moon, we're gonna see a very different kind of surface with lots and lots of craters. This is a geologically old surface. There hasn't been any weather. The moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so there's no weather, or any volcanoes to change it. And so we can see the history of the moon on this side, how it has been bombarded by meteors and things flying through space. Now, a lot of people uh, call this the dark side of the moon, but that is a misnomer. It does actually get sunlight. The moon is tidally locked to the Earth, meaning that it rotates at the same speed that it orbits the Earth. So we only ever see one side, but because it is rotating, different sides see the sun at different times. So a better name for that part of the moon is the far side, because it's the side that's farthest from the Earth. Now I could talk about the moon for a long, long time, but we have a whole universe to see. So let's start to head out. Now the moon is over 200, is about 240,000 miles away from Earth, and it took those Apollo astronauts over three days to get there, traveling at over 25,000 miles per hour. So we're starting to get to speeds and distances that are hard to imagine. So let's switch to a more useful unit of measurement. One of the ways astronomers describe distances is in light years, light minutes, light seconds, tells us how far light, the fastest thing in the universe, travels in a given unit of time. The moon is 1.3 light seconds from Earth, meaning it takes 1.3 seconds for light from the moon to reach the Earth. It also means that when you look up at the moon, you're seeing as it as it was 1.3 seconds ago. So that's an important thing to keep in mind as we continue our tour. Whenever we look up into the sky, we are looking into the past. We see things as they were when the light was first emitted. So the moon is the farthest that humans have been, but we've sent robots like rovers, probes, and landers even further. So now we're moving beyond the realm of Earth's influence and out into the solar system. At the center of our solar system is our star, the sun, which is about eight light minutes away, which is equivalent to 93 million miles. Our sun is a middle-aged star at about four billion years old. Orbiting around the sun, we have the eight planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Now you might be asking yourself, what about Pluto? Why didn't she mention Pluto? Pluto was my favorite. But Pluto was reclassified as a dwarf planet some years back and for good reason, I think. So I'm gonna put up the path of Pluto's orbit now. And you're gonna see that it's very different from the rest of the planets. 
all of the major planets, their orbits lie in the same plane. So if they were a dish, it would sit flat on a table. Pluto, on the other hand, you can see it is tilted with respect to the other planets. And it's also much more elliptical than the orbits of the other planets. Most of the planets have almost circular orbits. Pluto's is very elliptical or egg-shaped. Uh, in fact, at some points in its orbit, it crosses in front of Neptune. So it turns out that Pluto fits in a lot better with the other Kuiper Belt objects that we've discovered, uh, also known as trans-Neptunian objects. And now here are a bunch of their orbits. These are small icy bodies like comets and dwarf planets that orbit the sun past Neptune's orbit. In recent years, we've discovered some dwarf planets like Eris that are even bigger than Pluto. So I think Pluto is happy with its new classification. Instead of being the smallest planet, it's now everybody's favorite dwarf planet. Now, Pluto's orbit is about 10 light hours across. So it takes light 10 hours to get from one side to the other. But it took the New Horizons spacecraft nine years to travel to Pluto. So speaking of New Horizons, let's see how far human-made objects have traveled. New Horizons was launched in 2006, reached Pluto in 2015, and has been traveling through the outer reaches of the solar system ever since. In the 1970s, we launched Pioneers 10 and 11 and Voyagers 1 and 2 to take pictures of the gas giant planets and then leave the solar system. They are all traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravity. And even though they've been traveling for about 50 years, Voyager 1, which has traveled the farthest, still hasn't traveled as far as light makes it in one day. So we're now going to leave the solar system behind and head out into interstellar space, the space between the stars. The nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is four light years away. Compare that to the one light day that Voyager has traveled. So now I'm turning on something called the radio sphere. Now, this is not something you would actually see if you were to travel out into space, but it is a representation of how far human influence can be felt. In the 1930s, humans started emitting strong electromagnetic radiation in the form of radio waves, TV and radar signals, and atomic weapons detonations. These signals were strong enough to leave Earth. They travel at the speed of light, which means that the earliest signals have traveled about 90 light years. So that's the radius of our radio sphere. Maybe someone out there has detected them, but where could that someone be? So these markers I've put up now indicate stars where astronomers have discovered exoplanets in orbit around them. An exoplanet is a planet orbiting a star other than the sun. The ones within the radio sphere are the only ones that have had a chance of detecting our radio signals. All the rest are too far away. And there are so many beyond our radio sphere. Astronomers now believe that most stars have planets orbiting around them, making our solar system not the exception we once thought it was, but the rule. One of the big topics of research these days is finding Earth-like planets with suitable conditions for life. We wouldn't be able to travel to those planets just yet, since it would take more than one lifetime to get there. But it's nice to know that they're out there. So now let's go beyond our stellar neighborhood and see what lies outside of it. Our little solar system lives in one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy. What we're looking at here is a computer model of what we think our galaxy looks like from the outside, but we haven't traveled outside of it, so we can't actually take a picture. 
but we can use our data and our knowledge of other galaxies to make a pretty good map. The Milky Way contains more than 300 billion stars, which means there are likely billions of planets out there. The galaxy is 130,000 light years across. The time it takes for light to travel from one end to the other is equal to the length of the history of the human species. But that's just our own galaxy. Two million light years away is the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest galactic neighbor, excluding dwarf galaxies like the small and large Magellanic clouds. The Milky Way and Andromeda are hurtling towards each other and will collide in about five billion years, creating a new combined galaxy nicknamed Milkdromeda. And I did not make that up. That is what it's called. You don't have to worry about this collision, though. Galaxies are mostly empty space, so there isn't much risk of our solar system colliding with another star. Also, life on Earth will already have ceased to exist, most likely, because of the sun's increasing temperature in its old age. So the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy are only two of the many hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise the known universe. And as we zoom out, all the dots that you are seeing represent not stars, but galaxies, each containing hundreds of billions of stars. Galaxies aren't evenly spaced. They tend to cluster together in groups. Andromeda and the Milky Way are part of what we call the local group, which in turn is part of a bigger cluster called the Virgo supercluster. So as we zoom out further and further, we're seeing more and more galaxies. You might notice an interesting shape. It kind of looks like the galaxies are clumped together to form sort of a bow tie or butterfly shape. And it looks sort of like the Earth is at the center of that. It looks like we are at the center of the universe. And that is not the case. The reason our data looks like this is because of the limitations of our technology, our ability to observe. We can only go look so far in every direction. It's like if you were to try and make a map of San Francisco by standing up on top of the museum in, in the living roof, and you were to draw just what you see. You could only look so far in every direction. And maybe there's fog in one direction. So you can't draw anything in that direction because you can't see anything. But that doesn't mean there's nothing there. So these dark patches, it's not that there's nothing there. It's just that the dust and gas of the disk of the Milky Way is blocking our view. Hopefully someday we will find a way to penetrate that disk and be able to see what's there. It will likely look a lot like what we see in the other directions. Also, the Earth is not at the center of the universe. There actually is no center of the universe. All right, so now let's go out even further still we're gonna see some red dots. And these represent quasars. Another name for a quasar is active galactic nucleus. These are the cores of young galaxies where gas is falling into the central black hole and extremely energetic electromag electromagnetic radiation is being released. These are all billions of light years away meaning that they existed in the earliest stages of the universe when galaxies were just beginning to form. If we could see what they look like right now, they might look a lot like our own galaxy, but we'll have to wait another 13 billion years to find out. I like to think of quasars as sort of the awkward, angsty teens of the universe, because they're young. All right, we are now going to zoom out as far as we can go. What we're looking at is called the cosmic microwave background. It's basically the universe's baby picture. Isn't it cute? This light was emitted about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, 
which occurred about 13.8 billion years ago. This is an image we get using radio telescopes. It's a temperature map. On average, the radiation currently has a temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin. That's equivalent to minus 455 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 270 degrees Celsius. So pretty cold, but it used to be hotter. Uh, when, the, when the cosmic microwave background first was created, it was very hot, very energetic. But over time, as the universe expanded, the wavelengths of those lights were stretched out, causing it to cool down. Now, like I said, the, it has a very cold average temperature, but there are little tiny fluctuations. The brighter areas on this map represent hotter, denser regions, and darker areas represent cooler regions. Cosmologists use those fluctuations to learn about how the earliest structures of the universe formed. This radiation comes from all directions, all at once, but don't worry, it's not dangerous. If you've ever seen static on an old television, some of that static is coming from the cosmic microwave background. So this is as far as we go. There's no light we can see past this point. If we want to directly observe anything older than this, we'll have to use some other method of observation. So for now, let's head back home. People often ask me what my favorite planet is, and I give them what seems like a boring answer, Earth. Humans are perfectly suited for Earth. It provides air that we can breathe, water we can drink. Its atmosphere protects us from harmful radiation from the sun. It provides trees whose shade we can sit under, flowers for us to smell, cats to pet, and dogs to play with. In the scheme of things, it may seem like a small, meaningless speck of dust, but to us, it's our only home. So when you next look up at the night sky, I hope you remember, in this vast universe, just how special our home truly is. And there we go, the Earth. All right, that is our show. Thank you so much for joining us.